Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for taking some time. This is the death hour, right? <laughs> like lunchtime, and you're eating, and you might. But I'm gonna keep this. I'm gonna keep you all engaged. We're gonna have some fun today. Um, again, this is called living as a Franciscan. So here's the deal. You may be accused of being a Franciscan. Let's see if we can find enough evidence to convict you today, right? So listen, here's how I want to start out. This is called a Franciscan identity inventory. I would like you to take this inventory to spend about five minutes. There's, a, there's um, 18 questions on. There are 18 questions on here. So um, as you answer the question, I want you to consider, is it not important, it, question or issue, important and very important. Just write that to the side. Now let's see if we can find some Franciscans in here today, all right? So just, um, we'll need some pencils. I guess these are pencils. Yeah, I got some pencils here. So let me just pass these out. Someone want to help me get these out? Okay, so everybody ready to jump in? I just want to uh, review this with you. Everybody ready to, let me turn, I'll turn my mic on. You good? Good? Need more time? No? Okay. Listen, we're going to have fun today, all right? What I, my, my hope is that, again, I'm Father Daniel Barrick. I go as pastor here 10 years ago. I was ordained here in 99, so I, I know some of you for many years. Um, and I meant to say this when we began Dr. Ford's presentation, but um, I'm sort of between assignments right now. Um, you know, the pandemic has kind of shaken up a lot of things. And, you know, during the pandemic, my mother died and no one was able to be with her. She didn't die of COVID, but she got pneumonia. So my dad's got terminal prostate cancer. Um, and so he's doing fine at the moment, but my province said, you know what? You need to go be with your family now. So that's Florida. I'm living with my brother. Dad's 40 minutes away. Um, and again, he's doing fine. So I'm helping out at local churches and Father Dan asked me to come out here and kind of help out with um, a, a movement we're trying to do with the liturgy here. So that's why I'm here. I'll probably be like a week, a month. You know, I'm like, I'm here till Thursday this time and I'll be back in December. Then we'll look at the new year and see how this pattern's going. But it's always Santa Barbara's home to me. It's like a, another home to me. I've lived now more with the friars than I have with, you know, my family in Florida. So I'm, I think that that should be a category. Have you lived with the, have you lived with poor Claire's or friars? You know, Clark, you may be a Franciscan. So I'm, um, yeah, like I said, I was a novice here in 92. I was ordained here in 99, so it's good to be with you today. So, but again, I know it's that magical hour, so I will try to keep you engaged. And again, this is, hopefully we can have some good discussion today, right? I hope it doesn't get too hot. If it does, I'll get some water. <laughs> we'll cool it down a little. But we're going to talk about how does Franciscan spiritual, spirituality or the charism of Francis apply to our lives? How do we live it, right? Hope that's why you're here today. If not, great time to exit. <laughs> but, um, and Father Joe, I know he set the foundation. I'm going to do this practical one, and he's going to uh, continue for the third part, I think, in December sometime. Okay, so let's do this inventory. Um, again, we'll look at the questions, have some fun, and again, important, not important, very important, okay, for Franciscan identity. Right, so this has to do with our lifestyle, right? Do you wear a habit? <laughs> Maybe you do when you're, when you're not around, you know. Are you regularly seen wearing old secondhand clothes and sandals, right? Who, who passes the, the sandal test today? Okay. Well, I'm in flip-flops. I was, I'm, I was mortified. I had these flip I have regular proper sandals. But I walked into mass. I'm like, ah! But anyway, that's close. All right. Is what we wear important? Not really, right? Yeah, I don't think it's that important. If you thought, it, if you rate it as important, not so much what we wear, right? It's, it's something a little more deeper. Some of us may identify ourselves more by a habit, you know, the, the poor Claire sisters, you know, but at the end of the day, I don't think it's a high priority value, right? Would you agree? Okay. Why do all Why? Um, they got hot toes? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mine are cold. But it's cold. I don't, you know, it's, Francis was barefoot. Maybe it's like a step above barefoot. You know, we could go barefoot next, but I don't know. That would be kind of a stinky, stinky uh, endeavor. Okay, number two, how might family and friends assess your type and quality of stuff? How much stuff do you got? And what kind of stuff is it? Right? So this is my mother's excuse for having too much. Like after she 
passed away. And even before that, we're trying to like, get stuff out of the house. And she'd say, I am a depression baby. I can't let go. And I said, Mom, isn't that great that you're aware of that? Now let it go. <laughs> but no. So I just took, I was home in Florida, went in the attic and took down, this is embarrassing, forgive me, Dad, 75 boxes of mostly Christmas stuff. Yeah. This is like, Dad, what, are you, what, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was happy to find the Halloween stuff, and that's another story, but... So how much stuff do you have, and does that condition you in the Franciscan spirit? How much stuff did Francis have? He went naked. He went full, full Monty naked, let everything go, right? And what he wore, he, what he decided to wear was what the poor were wearing, you know, which was probably not um, this. This is, this is a material that they didn't have, but he just wore what the poor, well, it was probably burlap, you know, something rough, Simple fabric, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, is, is it about our stuff? It could be, right? Maybe this is sort of an important issue. You know, you don't have to identify and out yourself how much stuff you have, but if we got so much stuff that we got several storage units, you know, we might look at that issue, right? We just might look at that issue. Um, because, again, we're on a journey of letting go. Life is a journey of letting go. So something that we need to be um, in dialogue. Would you agree it's sort of important? Sure. Yeah, okay. Again, I'm not going to wave my magic wand and find who's got the most stuff here. We're not, it's not about that today. Again, this is hopefully stimulates some um, conversation and some direction. Are you rather fond of animals? Okay, okay. So, yeah, we grew up with dogs. We tried to bring a cat in. Um, that, that didn't work too well with the dogs, but uh, I had birds. Um, I decided I don't think it was good to put birds in cages, but animals. Why, why the Franciscan connection to animals? <laughs> How many have bird baths, <laughs> right? Is this important? Yes. 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 Okay, yes. all right, I will leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's right, I do. I, my dad, I, I take care of my dad's bird baths, so too, right? Were you gonna say something, Ida? Yeah? You were raising your hand. You're... <laughs> oh, that is awesome, that is good. That's part of our connection to cre creation, right? To connect, that's, that's a good thing. So I would say maybe important. Um, does your choice of career, work, ministry align with gospel values? This is something we're going to spend a little more time on later on. You know, so choosing a career or you're you know, taking on a type of work. Now, it doesn't matter necessarily what the work is. We're going to talk a little bit about work. But um, how do you justify it? You don't have to do it right now, but we should be thinking about that. Do I, why just take any job? You know, or am I like, if I want to be a Franciscan, what kind of work am I going to do? What kind of, if I'm retired, what kind of ministry do I want to get involved in? I think it's, I think it's a pretty important issue, right? Pretty important issue. Though we could do lots of different things as long as we do it with that Franciscan spirit, right? To a point. <laughs> there are some jobs maybe that are not going to align too well with the gospel. So, Barbara, say it again. Mother, yeah, you're gonna, so I, that's one of my pictures. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a full-time job too, right? And it's still, it's still going, right, Barbara? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, did I tell you one time I asked my mom, I said, Mom, I was gonna preach on the Feast of uh, Solemnity of Mary. So I wanna talk about motherhood. I said, Mom, how do you know when your job's done? <laughs> you know, and I thought she'd said this beautiful thing. She, it, it, she, I thought she'd pause and say something beautiful that was gonna make me cry. You know what she said? when you don't need me anymore. I was like, wow, that was like a cold punch in the face. I'm like, and the more I thought about it, I'm like, she was right, you know? She goes, I'm raising you to be in the world, independent, so you don't need a mother. You know, you're, it doesn't mean I don't love you, but I'm raising you to be on your own. And when you're on your own and you're, you're taking care, then I know my job's done. But it really is never done. Right? <laughs> okay, let's talk about eco-awareness. Are you a vegetarian? No. Or vegan? No. Okay. Everyone thinks Franciscans are, you know? And they come to me and say, are you vegetarian? I said, no, and they're like, oh. I said, we love animals and some of them taste really good, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is that an important issue? You know, so some say, like my, my brother, I'm living with my brother, they were vegan for a while, and now they're pescatarians, so they're only the only creatures that come out of the ocean, which is great, I love seafood. But um, Thanksgiving's coming up, right? And they do this thing called tofurkey, but yeah, let's face it, if everybody had to kill what they ate, there'd be a lot more vegetarians, right? Because I don't think I could kill that turkey, but I do like it. <laughs> Someone had a hand up back here, yes? Well, um, I'm not a 
a vegetarian, but I do uh, try to encourage myself to thank the animals. Uh, oh, that's beautiful. That's kind of an indigenous thing, right? Or some cultures are really conscious of thanking the animal for the life that they take from the animal. But um, yeah, that's, so there's a mindfulness there. That's beautiful. We should be mindful about what we're consuming in food and drink. I think that's the important issue. What the environmental cost is for what we eat. How's that? That's, that's probably an important issue, especially the way the world is now. OK, do you recycle food containers and all that stuff? Yeah. Cycling, yeah, so returning. This is care of Sister Mother Earth, like in the Canticle of Creatures. Care of Sister Mother, we need to be conscious. We can't be a complete throwaway society because it's, it's catching up with us to a big time now. We know that, right? Is your, pri is your primary mode of transportation eco-friendly? How did you get here today? I walked. <laughs> but um, again, important issue. Um, it could be important, right? Look at the cost on the environment of our transportations now, you know, so um, we're gonna, I'm going to spend a little time on this in the process, but I wanted to get us thinking about it, so it's, it, it could be an important issue because of its cost on the environment. Are you conscious of your overall carbon footprint or impact on the environment? You know, there's a test you can take, like an examination like this, to uh, evaluate um, your carbon footprint, which is how much you are costing the environment by your lifestyle. Yeah, have y'all done that here before? So some, parish, some parishes do that as a parish exercise just to see like, wow, I didn't know that. You know, what, like electricity costs, fuel costs, again, food and environment, all that stuff. It's a good thing to take. Um, how might you describe your relationship to the created world? Are you in it and of it? Are you kind of you know, a consumer just taking what you need and not thinking about the future, or do we, do we, are we in that mentality? So, then again, right now, these are really important issues that you see around the world, the cost of lifestyle uh, on the planet, and let's face it, the, the real burden of that cost is on the poorest of the people, poorest of the uh, communities in the world, as sea rises and you have those coastal communities, so we're gonna spend a little time talking about this. Okay, let's jump to spirituality. How much daily time is allotted for prayer and Eucharist and that kind of thing. How much of your day do you devote? Do you start the day kind of rooted in prayer? Do you end the day? Are there periods during the day where you're connecting to Christ? Because it's a great way to live and we're gonna look at, that comes from a very lived practical reality of France, early Franciscans and even now today. So um, it's, I think it's a really important issue how much time because the more prayerful we are, the more rooted in prayer we are, the better our lives are gonna be and the more connected we're gonna to be to how we are on the earth and to our God. So I would say this is a very important issue. How does your environment include visible signs of your faith? Again, I, I was playing around with that question about being accused. If you were accused of being a Christian or Franciscan, would we find evidence? I used to do this with the kids in confirmation too. I'd say like, if we came into your room, what would we see there? <laughs> Besides um, electronics, you know, would we find any crucifix, scripture, Bible, pictures, holy pictures, when my, my brother and I shared a room for 24 years. That's another homily. Um, <laughs> my mom had that picture of the Madonna of the streets. You know that picture? It's just a simple, simple woman holding a child. And actually, we just found it the other day. I'm like, oh, that's that picture. Somebody gave me a statue of it. But we have tons of stuff in our house, you know? And then some people go overboard. Some people are really sparse, you know? I remember one of my relatives said they thought the crucifix was too scary for kids. And I was like, oh, you know, it, some, pe some people think that too, maybe for kids. I don't know. It's, 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 what's that? I know, but look at that. Look at, look at what they're looking at on television and, and the video games. Hanging. Yeah, yeah. And, and like I went, I remember when I was in LA at a parish, I was pastor there for about five years. I invite, was entered to a house and this woman had all these life-size statues. It was like, I'd hate like for the power to go out and you're walking around bumping into these moves. It was kind of a little creepy, a little creepy. What, were you, what did you say, Barbara? When I watched my son, he has three children. And he said he can send to the rosary. And he said, well, I'm going to go to the rosary. And he does, it's crucifix and beads. So, um, but does he have any like in the house? Is he, is he one of these parents that thing is trying to feel like it's a little harsh for a child to look at a crucifix? No, they actually, yeah. actually sing lines. My three-year-old both had the same lines. Oh, 
Okay. Already. Wow. Yeah. So again, spirituality, I think it's a really, really important, I put this in a high importance, however you landed on that one, okay? Attitude, I know we just have an hour, so I'm trying to be conscious of time, trying to do a lot. Attitude, disposition, and characterizing you, might family, friends describe you as humble? Did anyone like circle these? <laughs> or write in your own? <laughs> humble, courteous, joyful, grateful, a peacemaker. How many peacemakers do you find today in families and stuff? Those are hard to find. Those, those are, they should be well paid. Or a person of compassion, you know? And these kind of uh, are fundamental characteristics, virtues of a Franciscan. So I think, again, this, how do you present yourself? We're gonna spend a, a little time on this, how you present to the world in terms of your attitude and disposition. I think it's pretty important. Cheerful joy, yeah, right? Joy, Francis, Francis was known to be a real, like almost a fool, uh, he was so filled with joy. And are these qualities important in those whom you call friends? How do you pick your friendships? You know, do you look for good qualities? Or is it like whatever? I was hanging around this person in school, you know? Sometimes friends can take you down. Sometimes, like, for instance, um, like when I was a kid, I always looked up to people that were better than me. I wanted, those are the kids I wanted to hang around with. Whereas my sister, who became a nurse, she wanted to take care of the world. So she was always bringing, we had this Christmas party every night and Christmas night in our house, and my parents said, you can bring whatever you want. So I'm like, again, people I look up to, and my sister's peeing the dregs of society, you know? She, she dragged, and God, I mean, she was more Franciscan than I was, right? I think she's taking care of the poor. People that had no place to go, she always made sure they, they had a, came, came to our place, and that's why I think she's a nurse today. My sister Holly is great. Okay, I think these are, um, maybe the friendship thing is maybe not that important, but certainly those dispositions I think are pretty important. How, you pre how we present to the world, people will know that we're Franciscan or not. Social community involvement. Are you involved in any type of direct service to the poor? Very important part of Franciscan life. In fact, important part of his conversion was how he reached out and it just transformed him. And it became a regular part of not only his life, but of those who follow him, the Franciscans too. So I think it's a pretty important piece. Doesn't have to be a whole lot, but I think we should always be mindful of those who are struggling around us and do what we can with what God has given us. Do you regularly exercise your right to vote? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's a good, that's an important, and being involved in the civic community, now I, I, that's why I don't want this to get too hot, right? We just have midterm elections, it can start boiling, but um, anyway. <laughs> Not only voting, but how, uh, next question, does your political affiliation viewpoint align with what most concerned Jesus while on earth? Highlight in the gospel, because let's face it, there's a lot of opinion out there, a lot of viewpoint, but and my argument would not be anyone who's not baptized, but for those who are baptized, how do you ground your viewpoint in what was important to Christ? That's a Franciscan or a Christian political viewpoint then. Because if you got a lot of hot air about something that really didn't matter to Jesus, I'm like, well, why do you have the, why? You know, what would be the reason for that? And if we're Christian, and we're, especially we're on following Francis, our opinions and viewpoints should be rooted in what was important to him. Because we're following him. And if we're not doing that, who's doing that, right? Who's going to care about those issues if we don't? So that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> because it could, it could get pretty hot. Um, last one, are you involved in any action activity to heal our planet? So we already mentioned some of those things, but it's something we need to look at. It's very important to Franciscans because I'll explain why we're gonna cover this, why that's an important piece. So I, I would say that's a pretty important as well. We are of the planet, it is our mother. We have to treat her with respect and care. Okay, so did you add up your points? Shall we see who's the most Franciscan in the room? I'm not gonna go there, no, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> because it ain't, it ain't me, hopefully it's one of you. Okay, so this is a primer to get us thinking about some of those things, and let's spend a little more time in the 30 minutes that we have left, and I wanna leave a little time for questions and discussion, okay? Sound good? All right, let's go. So, living as a Franciscan. Let me see if I do this right. Oop. What makes a person Franciscan? So we could look at all the stereotypes, which we just did, you know, like the one that loves animals, the one wears the brown, bird bath owner, these are stereotypes. So look at this image here. It's all about birds and puppies and <laughs> dogs, right? You know, the, that's the cute version of Francis. A lot of times we do this to our saints. We make them really cute, and this is especially good for kids. I don't mind it for kids. But we grow up a little bit, you know, like, yeah, so is, that, is it all about the stereotypes? 
Or is it about the extreme? So if I make myself look like Francis, you know, I kind of wear the right clothes, take the shoes off. In fact, there's a, there's a um, one of the uh, sort of a reform of the order and they're totally, they wear like a really rough fabric and they, you know, everyone thinks they got the, the better idea of what Francis wanted to do and so they're barefoot and they're running around and they shave their heads. So is it about that? Is that important? Or here's the, the last issue. Do we need another St. Francis and St. Clair in the world right now. <laughs> so maybe we do need it, but it, is that God's plan? Just to keep popping out facsimiles of Francis and Clair. No, they did their thing. One of the important parts of the Franciscan writings is Francis said, look, I did my thing. It's your turn now. How has God equipped you and gifted you and made you to be the dream of what he needed to be? And I guarantee you it ain't gonna be St. Francis, but it may be something even better. You know, God has, gifts us and makes us, and we were all so unique. If everyone lived up to their full potential, what a world we'd live in, right? But it's not gonna be another Clara Francis, right? They did their thing. We can move in that direction, but we're gonna do it uniquely because each of us is unique and we have unique gifts that God has given us to do our part to make the world the dream that God intends it to be. Does that make sense? So it's not gonna be about any of these things. What makes us Franciscan? It's gonna be, let's see. So I just want to sort of briefly cover the fundamentals that um, undergird the spirituality that is considered Franciscan. So a lot of this I'm getting from, this, when I ever do a presentation, I pull a lot from Bill Short's Poverty and Joy. This is a great, look how skinny it is. This is my kind of book. Skinny with lots of pictures, right? <laughs> I had to take a class when I was doing landscape architecture, I had to take a class in environmental law. Big fat books, tiny print, no pictures. I, mean, I said, I, I, it was the worst, my worst course. Got a C in that one. He's like, what's going on? I go, I need pictures. Pictures in my books. So uh, again, according to Bill Short, he kind of broke down some of the main characteristics. So I just want to go through this briefly. Father Joe covered this. I, my next slide is going to pick up off of this and some of the points that Father Joe talked about last month. So. We follow, if, you've, if you read the rule of Francis, what he did is he grabbed a bunch of gospel passages and strung them together. Francis wants to imitate Christ. He wants to follow in the footsteps. So that's what the rule was, and the, 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 the greatest uh, priority is to follow in the footsteps of Christ. It is incarnational, you know, we know that means it's to take on flesh. God entered fully into the human condition, right? That's a big emphasis on our spirituality. Um, it's a gravitation toward the poor and marginalized because that was an important part of Francis's transformation and conversion as a young, uh, kind of a spoiled kid. You know, he had this experience, but it was when he reached out to those in need, and, and so that's why it's an important part of ours as well. Um, and it's deeply rooted in Christian prayer because Francis and Claire and many of those early followers, they spent so much time in many different forms of prayer too. So um, it's gonna be a prayerful life. It's gonna identify with the cross. And Francis wrote a whole thing on the passion, a whole prayer kind of uh, uh, prayer form on the passion of Christ. So it's an identification of the gift of God's love that comes through the cross. And lastly, it's this kinship. And most of that kind of is rooted in the fact that he wrote that canonical of the creatures, this connection to creation. That's why we get caught up in bird baths and all that stuff, but it, it stems from that original. One of the first examples of early Italian language poetry, that is, the Canticle of Creation. All right, this is, these are some of the points that Joe emphasized that, are, that we're building from those other points. So he, that was his first point. He said, God, God is all that is good, right? Everything that's good, so truth, beauty, all the good stuff in life, and it's the highest good, it's an infinity of good, so God is good. It's a basic premise. God is not a judge or a punisher, right? God is good and gives us good things, even when they're hard things. And because of free will, you know, we go through difficulties in life, but at the bottom line, God is good and wants good for us. Um, it's a free choice incarnation. It's not a response to sin. You know, I think Father Joe went into that point, right? It's this gift of, look, even if we didn't sin, Christ would come anyway because Christ loves us and wants to be with us. So Christ was not a response to sin in the world, like, oh, Crap, now I, gotta go, like, now I gotta come down, you know? That is not a Franciscan viewpoint. Um, it brought salvation, the crucifixion, you know, so we, we embrace that and recognize that. It is part of the reason Jesus came to earth, but the bottom line, it's a love game. It's a love, it's a love movement, and it always will be. 
So there, even if we didn't sin, Christ would have come anyway because he wants to be with us and he loves us. It's a free choice. That's, called, um, that's from Don, John Duns Scotus. It's called The Primacy of Christ, the um, Theology of the Primacy of Christ. It's Christ-centered, and Christ is the image of God. So we want to wonder, like when people say, like, I don't know if there's God in the world, Jesus said, look at me, look at what I'm doing. I am God in the world, God incarnate. So that's, it's, it's, it's very Christian. I just want to, let me just say this too. A lot of what we're going to talk about today, you say, well, you could say, well, that's just Christian, right? Yeah, it may be. But we, as Franciscans, maybe emphasize a part of that Christian thing more. Because again, it's Christmas, Chris, uh, Francis wanted to follow the gospel. So a lot of what Franciscans are doing is just what's already in the gospel. Here, this last point, Joe made a point about this. Every creature is unique. So the Latin word for that is hechitas. How many of you remember the Latin mass when the priest would hold up the host and say, hoc est corpus meum? Right, remember that? Okay. I never, I don't, I know. it wasn't me, but. So this, it, the word hechitas comes from hope, this. So hechitas means thisness. So this is another uh, John Duns Scotus point. Everyone is embellished and imbued with a gift of thisness. There is no other thisness beyond who you are, Cappy. You know, you have a unique hechitas. Everything, but it's not just humans. It's every blade of grass has a unique thisness, hechitas. Everything is uniquely endowed with a particular um, presence of God, even the most minute, every grain of sand, everything, but most especially human beings have a unique hechitas, a thisness to it. Um, and we, are, we have that uniqueness, but we also offer it in relationship. So we believe in a very relational world, and we're part of this emphasis on relationship. Why? Because the very heart of God is a relationship, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. God is relationship, holy relationship. So we are made for relationship and community. Okay, any questions on the fundamentals? Good, I'm going to go to the next slide. <laughs> Okay, so praxis, that famous word that says where the rubber hits the road. So this is the, the, what undergirds what we believe and hold to be dear as Franciscan. How do we live it? It's one thing to aspire to it, but what does it look like lived out, and what should a Franciscan do? Okay, how many like the office? <laughs> you know, so it's one thing to believe it, but guess what? We've got to start doing it. And there's, there's supposed to be a quote that says Disney here. Let me see if it comes up if I hit again. Disney, hello, there you go. Get started by start doing it. So even if you're not sure, do something anyway and we can evaluate it later. So let's talk about prayer. How do, what does it mean to pray like Franciscans pray? Okay, let's first talk about the why. And again, I mentioned this in the beginning. The lives of Francis and Claire were just, I mean, he spent so much time <laughs> to the point where um, it was almost too much time in prayer. In fact, and he was such a good preacher um, at one point, Francis asked uh, Claire, and I think it was Brother Rufus or Sylvester, one of the brothers, like, what should I do? Should I, can I just like, stay in the cave? <laughs> you know, or, should I, which, or should I preach or I stay in the cave? And they got together and they, they discerned, they did spiritual discernment, and the response was, guess what? Both. You need to preach and you need your prayer time. That, uh, that is the foundation of what comes out of your preaching. So. But when you look at their lives, like Francis, he, he, not even, he not only did like a 40-day period of Lent during the typical Lent time, but he had Lent throughout the year. He had one in the, uh, in the summer and then in the fall, another 40-day periods of fasting and private prayer. So he was just, you know, and, and that was just one aspect of how he broke up his year. But his day, it is, it's rooted in prayer. Why? Jesus models a life of prayer, especially we're reading in the Gospel of Luke now in cycle C. You notice particularly Luke emphasizes, before makes, Jesus makes a big decision, he always takes time to pray, and it's written in the Gospel. Jesus went off to pray. Jesus went off to pray. That's right before he chose his 12, right before he just made major uh, discourses in the Gospel. So um, Jesus was a man of prayer. Francis wanted to be like Jesus, so of course we're going to be people of prayer. And um, it's regular prayer, and it's the basis of good spiritual discernment, which is how do we make decisions and choices in the world. If we're not doing that prayerfully, then we're going to be bouncing off in a lot of different directions, um, especially the big, important decisions of life, you know, like choosing a partner. We, we used to teach a, a discernment course at SSJ in my last parish. So discernment's good for one thing that never changes, because we have to discern this, right, that God is crazy about us. God loves us, and there's nothing we can do to change that. 
Some people don't even get to that first step, but hopefully we're there. Like, first major discernment uh, issue is God is crazy about us, loves us, and there's nothing we can do to change that. We can rest in that. Second is that discernment that we need to make the big choices in life, so choosing a career or a partner or a lifestyle, all these things need to be rooted in good spiritual discernment. And then lastly, we need discernment for all those day-to-day things that come up, right? Like, how do I discipline my kid in this situation? Or like a choice at work or a sort of a, a moral compromise at work? How do we navigate that? Those come up regularly. So we need discernment for that as well. But our discernment's not going to be good if it's not rooted in good, solid prayer. So that's, very, that's a Christian thing, and it's a very Franciscan thing as well. Okay, how does a Franciscan pray? Well, again, I, I just mentioned a few of the things on the last slide. It's liturgical prayer. So liturgy is a fancy uh, Greek or, origin word that means our form of public prayer together. Anything that we do publicly as a church together is called our liturgical prayer. So it includes a celebration of the Eucharist at Mass, includes the liturgy of the hours, anything that is organized as a public form of liturgical prayer is, is liturgy. So Francis certainly was that. He, he writes a lot about uh, the power of the Eucharist for him, and he goes on and on about priests, too, like the hands of the priests. And even though at his time there was a lot of corrupt ones and corrupt bishops and cardinals, he still says, even if they were torturing me, still I would respect the position of what they do and bring to the church, of bring, you know, the, the hands that bring the Eucharist down through the Holy Spirit to make it the body and blood of Christ. I told you about the extended retreats, the, the private prayer, and all the kinds of fasting. And Francis admits that he was very hard on his body at the end of life. He called his body Brother Ass, the donkey version. Um, and he says, Brother Ass, he was hard because he knows he really stretched it a little bit too much. And he, he died young, 46. He had a lot of health concerns because he did these extensive fasts and was always um, depriving himself. But again, one does not have to pray like St. Francis. This is a model of what he did. We've got to find our own rhythm. We have to find our own style of prayer that works for us because we're all different temperaments. I had a friend who was very active. She was in this parish a long time ago, but she was so active, she, she was hard, it was hard for her to settle down. So she said her best prayer was when she was swimming laps in the pool. She called it her holy pause. And she's like, is that okay? I'm like, of course it's okay, right? If you're connecting with God, you need to, you need to keep your body running, you know, just to get it uh, not to be distracted. Absolutely. Because prayer is about connection, right? It's a connection. It's a listening and it's a speaking. It's a both. It's a conversation. All right? So prayer, that's why prayer is so important. And it doesn't matter which one we do or we can take many forms. So a Franciscan is a person of prayer. Now let's talk about the body because we are an incarnational faith. We emphasize incarnation. What does that mean? It's when something becomes flesh. Carne. Carne, those who speak Spanish. Carne is flesh, so incarnation is to put flesh on. Incarnation, so we emphasize the fact that God isn't remotely staring at us from above. That's why you may love that song um, by Bette Midler. From a distance. You know that song? God is watching us. It's a great song. It's not very Christian. Because <laughs> it's this remote God. Christians celebrate the fact that God wasn't just remote. It came in, took on flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. God wanted to get very near. That's why we sing that communion song today, Draw Near. Christ, through the person of Christ, God wants to be very close to us. So we emphasize that uh, as Franciscans. Human person is a privileged place of God's dwelling. Every human being has in dignity. We experience Christ in the other, so we see others in need, and therefore we can't look away. We need to respond because there goes Christ in the poorest. There was what Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa was a good Franciscan. She said, she called it Christ and God in most, uh, the poor were Christ's most distressing disguise. I think that's the word she used, the phrase she used. Okay, I don't want to go back. I wanted to touch on that. But we do it, um, we celebrate the body because God chose it as his dwelling place. You know, we say, well, God may be here, that God's on a mountain. Yeah, but also God is in the human person. So we can't look away. We are connected and God is in all of us. Christ is in all of us. Um, so we go from the bo- prayer to the body to creation now because we see God in creation. Most of this comes, this part of our spirituality comes from the Canticle of the Creatures. That, by the way, 1225 was one year before Francis died, and he was suffering then. So here's this man, practically blind, 
in a cave writing this uh, beautiful canticle out, which celebrates, and it seems very joyful, you know, but he was really, he was really suffering. And maybe it was a way to sort of pick up his spirits. But um, because of that, because of this beautiful poem that we believe was put to music, um, and there's, if you go to Assisi, there's, there's, a, there's a famous um, Assisi, uh, there's a famous friar that's in Assisi, his name is Alessandro, I don't know if you have any of his CDs, but um, he, he says what he thinks he found is the original music that goes with this, and it's the tune, if you ever watch Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, that old, that movie from the 70s, that was one of uh, Zeffirelli's first, it's beautiful, but they use that song, Brother, Son, and Sister, Moon, that is the melody that he thinks was the original one for this one. So anyway, it was, it was neat because he, we were there visiting. He was our uh, tour guide and we were visiting Santa Maria de Angeli where the Porzilunca is, that little tiny church that Francis and his Franciscans worshiped in. He, he's, we said, Alessandro, you got to sing something for us. And he sang that in, in Italian with, the, with that poem. So it was very nice. So we experience and we celebrate our connectedness to creation. Why? Because... That poem calls, it's not like, hey, you know, the sun's great. He said, this is our brother, sun. This is our sister, the moon and the stars. Sister, water, brother, fire, brother, wind. You know, it's a familial relationship. So whenever we pray the Our Father, we recognize that God wants us to recognize that we are a family, our Father. Instead of, oh God, it's our Father. And Francis saw that with all of creation, even at the end, sister bodily death. He saw that as part of God's plan. It's a part we'd rather check out of, right? <laughs> what did Ellen say? I, I, don't mind, I don't mind dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. You know, we, we kind of get afraid of it. But he said, you know, it's part of God's plan. Part of God's plan. I keep reminding my dad this as he kind of comes to the end of life. So here's our blue-robed Franciscan, Julie Andrews. <laughs> You know, Franciscans experience God in all of creation, from the tiniest hummingbird or insect to uh, certainly a mountain range. You know, if we have that kin if we celebrate that kinship with creation, we are moving in the right direction for Franciscan spirituality. Okay, let's talk about work. Does it matter what we do for work? This was in our quiz. What sort of work does a Franciscan do? Can you see the Franciscans in there? Okay. Where does this come from? I was looking up um, text to try to give some basis to um, what, I, what we want to discuss today. So this is from the Testament of St. Francis. Again, 1226 is about the year he died, but he wrote a, a testament to the order. And in there we find in paragraphs 20, 23, this, these words about work. I worked with my hands. I still desire to work. I earnestly desire all brothers give themselves to honest work, right? Let those who do not know how to work learn not from desire to receive wages, but for example, and avoid idleness. You know, it was in our reading today, right? Some of you are not getting busy, but acting like busybodies. That used to be the word in there. We get in trouble when we're not busy and conscious of being productive. And we are not paid for work. Let us have recourse to the table of the Lord, begging alms from door to door. So um, work is an important part. Now, does it matter what we do, though? Does he get into the specifics of that? He doesn't. He says honest work. So can you experience what you do or have done or maybe are doing now as a minister as Franciscan? So that's why I got my family image here, Barbara, the mother, father. That's an important part of work. You know, my, um, when I talk to my family, they're like, I don't know if this is a good thing to do. I said, you're providing for your family. It's honest work. It's good. So you, we all have to uh, uh, discern that for ourselves. You know, can you think of things that would not be very Franciscan? work that you want to repeat out to everybody <laughs> you know yeah, so maybe you know some people like um, yeah no I'm not going to give you that example <laughs> it's a personal thing okay let's talk about transportation how we got here today notice the pictures here um, Tina's here Tina the, 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 the Dutch have a real solid relationship with the bicycle right there, I, I was reading, I'm, I, I'm, I'm hopefully going to be in Amsterdam. I want to do some photography with the tulip time in April. But they're saying, like, do not step in the bike lanes because you will get flattened, right? <laughs> There's a, it's a real strong bike, cut, bike culture, and it's winter. It's any time of year, right? I don't know how they ride those bikes on icy roads, but um, does it, why does this matter? Because Francis had something to say about it. In his earlier rule, Francis has two different rules. 
One we found that the Pope actually put a stamp on, but we believe even it doesn't, the one that didn't have a stamp, the earlier one, was still accepted by the Pope, even though he didn't stamp it. When brothers go through the world, let them take nothing for the journey. So where did you hear? We've heard that before, right? That's a, that's a, that's a gospel thing. And I command all my brothers, both cleric and lay. So cleric just means those who are ordained. Francis, we believe, was ordained a deacon, but not a priest, because he talks about, um, uh, he associates with cleric, but we don't think he was ordained a priest. There's no evidence of it. When they go through the world or dwell in places, they in no way keep any animal, either with them, and this is in terms of using an animal for transportation, right? Or I don't think it's like pets. <laughs> I don't think it means pets. But let it not be lawful for them to ride horseback unless they are compelled by sickness or grace. Why would he, why would he care about this? What do you think? It's, yeah, so let me have another slide about this too. So we talk about the different forms of transportation, their efficiency and their cost to the planet. So if you go by foot, it's the cheapest, right? But I mean, Francis is running all over. I mean, he made it to Egypt and the, a boat was involved in part of that, but it was walking. He wanted them to walk. It, it, you wouldn't have to rely on anything else. It was cheaper. He, I think part of the reason about the horses was the fact it was, it cost something. It was considered luxury travel. Yeah, if you rode a horse. I think there's part of that is there. So foot is least cost, least efficient, because it takes a long time, but you move slow, more slowly through the world, don't you? You notice more. How many of you have done the Camino in Spain? Yeah, so you move slow, right? And some people go nuts with that stuff, and some people just really find themselves, because their whole world slows down. They're taking it step by step. Um, so then we have horseback or carriage. At Francis' time, it was premium, right? But it was, certainly was the most efficient. It got you there quicker. Um, there's a great quote from Teresa Vavla from Falling Out of a Carriage. You know, ever heard that quote? She, Teresa Vavla is a Spanish uh, 16th, century, 16th century. And, you know, she, she, so she hit a bump and she fell. It was a rainstorm and she's fallen up in a dirty puddle. And she's like, it was a carriage, though. And she's, her, she's famous for saying, Lord, if this is how you treat your friends, I'm under how you have so few of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so in our modern times, we, we graduate to trains and buses. Okay, there's a little more cost there, more efficiency, but then we're starting to, you know, it's fossil fuel, so we're starting to affect our planet. Then there's the automobile, more cost, cost of care, and variable efficiency, you know, because it depends if, you're, if, you're like, if your car breaks down or whatever, but anyway, it's more efficient. And then lastly, I think, is there, I guess people are going on rockets now. I didn't, I didn't put rockets up here, but that's, I don't think most of us experience that. They had a premium cost, and then you have different levels of, of class in your travel. Premium efficiency, but again, greatest carbon footprint. Planes are, are doing the, uh, all the plane travel are, are, are have a great, uh, probably between cars and planes are um, taxing the planet on most with the most with the fallout. So again, why would Francis care about that? He wants us to live simply, right? So it doesn't mean if you're driving a car, you're taking a plane, you're not Franciscan. We just have to be mindful of it, right? Just got to be mindful of the cost, and maybe we kind of negotiate how often we do that, the reasons for doing it. Um, so there's no right or wrong here, but it's something we need to be mindful, it's something we need to discern about the cost of it, how it looks, and um, all that. Make sense? Okay, and that's all we'll say about that. I'm not going to get evaluated. Okay. That we're, going, we're, we're kind of coming down to the end here. There's not too much more. Disposition, how we present ourselves to the world, right? So there's some virtues that are probably more considered Franciscan, even though these are all gospel virtues. But this is why. It comes up in the writings, and it comes up in our tradition. So the first one I thought of was joy. It, humble or joy could be first. You know, we, we have that prayer, the peace prayer of St. Francis, which he did not write. <laughs> It's, but it's attributed to his spirituality. It came in the early part of the last century. It's very much a Franciscan prayer, even though he didn't compose it. I'm so glad we have so much that Francis actually did write. That's not, nothing he did write, but it, it, it does speak to what was important to him. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. That's the first part of the prayer. So to be a peacemaker is really a very Christian, gospel, and Franciscan thing to do. Emphasis. So... I don't know if that's you here today, if you're a peacemaker in your family, but it's of great value, especially today. But it is something we can trace to what was important to Francis. And a lot of that has to do, too, with his visit of the Sultan when he went down to Egypt. 
So this is during the, the, um, the Crusades. There was a crusade at the time of Francis, and a lot of men, a lot of, yeah, was, let's face it, it was men going down to take Jerusalem back from the infidels, and it was a lot of slaughter. Francis was, was appalled by all of that. And even though the, you know, we ended up being the proprietors of most of the best sites in the Holy Land, the cust it's called the custody, um, he was appalled at all the slaughter and the death and destruction that was going on as a result of these crusades. So he went down there to say, you know, to talk to the Sultan, and, and he did, and he managed to keep his life. You know, he, he had a very solid and productive and robust conversation, and he was able to be sent back with his life. So something about his ability to get into a sticky, hot situation and have a conversation, that's a great gift to have. Not all, not all of us have that gift, but it certainly is a very important part of our spirituality, peacemaking, and we need it today, don't we? Yeah, it's hot out there. It's hot out there. We need more peacemakers. And part of that is just listening, you know? We don't have to prove like we're right. So again, when we get into, especially into politics, you know, try listening, even though you don't agree and you think the person's wrong. Just listen, you know? It does a one, it does a good just to listen and say, okay, well, thank you for that. You don't have to show you agree. And just by listening doesn't mean you agree with them. So it's something, we, peacemaking is a gift that we need in the world. But courtesy, this comes from one of the little flower stories. The, there's a whole tradition of writings about the life of Francis we call the, the little flowers of St. Francis. You know, it's, it's sort of like some of the stories in the gospel. They say all stories are true and some of them really happened. We're not sure what some of these stories, but they point to something important about the Franciscan tradition, which is why they lasted all these years. So there's something about courteous, being courteous, which is a part of being kind and respecting the, the goodness of the other. Humility, so much about humility in, in Francis's writings. So there's a little quote from the earlier rule, let all brothers strive to follow humility and poverty of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not just Francis woke up one morning and said, I'm gonna be humble. He's looking at Christ and he's saying, there's the king, you know, getting, getting crowned with thorns, giving his life away. How humble is that? You know, God who had all the riches and splendor of the glory and being in heaven, cast that all away to become a human being and to give his life away. Francis was blown away by that. And not only that gift of salvation, but Eucharist, that Christ would also become a simple piece of bread. Why? So that he could be intimate with us and we could feed on him. So that humility just blew the socks off of Francis. So much writing about that. And then, of course, joy. Joy. Francis was a fool for God, and so he looked very joyful. There's the preaching to the birds. There's the story of the, the violin he made out of sticks. He's just like a fool for God and just basically on fire with joy about his love and the love that he felt coming into from, from God. So these are important dispositions. Again, would anyone accuse you of being any of these? Can I just suggest that maybe one other thing you could add to that is thoughtfulness. Thoughtfulness. Say, what do you mean by that, Jim? Uh, thinking about putting yourself in, in the shoes of other people, right? Um, it comes from the whole thing of being listening. It's, it's also um, thinking about other people that comes out of your prayer. So I think that's in the gospel. In the gospel, or, and maybe it's one of Paul's letters that said, think of others as more important than yourself. Do we, does anyone experience that today? I don't. It's all about me, and you know, you're going you're gonna to listen to my viewpoint. I'm going to convince you. you know, no, that's not getting us anywhere. Not getting us anywhere. So uh, I know it's 12.15 right now, so I'm going to kind of fly through this. But Francis wrote this beautiful salutation of the virtues. You see a lot of these in here in this celebration of, again, dispositions of how we present to the world. If we're seen as angry all the time, is anyone going to believe in God? If I'm supposed to be a disciple, a follower of Christ, and I'm angry all the time, we've got to work on that. You know? I'm not saying we have reason to be angry. We do, maybe. But we have to work that through and find a way to present something else. And if we are angry, then we, I always say when we're angry, anger is a neutral emotion. It's not a sin, but it's what we do with our anger. And if we speak, anger is a sign that says something's not right. No going right. I lost one of my microphones here. This is the recording one. Let me put it back on. Um, something's not right in the world, so speak your truth with love in a way that you would like to hear it, and you're moving in the right direction with what to do with anger. And it takes work. It takes skill to be able to do that. It takes practice, too. Practice on your family. 
<laughs> um, so what underlies the virtues is this is what uh, Francis found in Christ, and it's certainly something we need for our world. Okay, fair enough in that. And last thing I think has to do with community. Um, you can see some of these images that Francis, Franciscans get involved in the world and its issues. So I have a couple of topics here of engagement. Why does a Franciscan care about peace? Because it's a part of our tradition, Francis's peacemaking. Is the world a place of justice? I should have put that with the justice one, but um, no, it's not. So what do we want to do about that? And how do we do it in a way that shows that we are experiencing God's love? You know, we can do this. I remember when, when I was in a, a postulancy, one of the brothers who was really much into eco-justice, he said, okay, we're going to recycle. I didn't know what it was in 1992, I, 1991. I didn't know what recycling was. So he got this thing of cans and he threw it on the ground in the glass. We're going to do this. I mean, it was so like anger. I'm like, I don't know what, do, what you're doing, but I don't, have, I don't want any part of it because I don't like your energy. You know, it was just this kind of anger energy. And um, sometimes those who are really involved in justice have that. It's what's fueling them. But they're looking at the world and saying, the world, things are not right. So how do we have that? I mean, that's true, they're not right, but how do we approach it in a loving and humble way and, and do, it, do that diligent work? Politics, so, so again, is there a party affiliation that is more Franciscan than the other? This is where it gets really hot, right? So whatever party you are, how do you justify it from your Franciscan perspective? That's all I'm saying, justify it. And it's same with a political viewpoint. If you care about I mean, we should be caring about people crossing the border, but for different reasons, right? Not just because it's an illegal thing, or they might take something from us. That is not a Franciscan viewpoint. Franciscan viewpoint, okay, if, that, if we have issues with that, let's, let's get our fuel from what would fuel Jesus about it. Because it's a very long-standing biblical tradition to care what happens to the alien and the orphan and the widow. That's a very Christian thing to care about that. Now, how we want to solve it, too, is another thing. So, just be, uh, we're not going to get into the issues, but say, well, however we land on that, we should form it through the scriptures and from our Franciscan tradition, if we want to call ourselves Franciscan. Same with justice. We care the world is not, the world, God does not want a world of haves and have nots. That God wants a world where we're all equal. That's how God would want it, and it's not the way it is. So, what do we want to do about that? Say so community organizing, Francis, the life of Christ. Think how much time Christ and Francis spent bringing community together. Jesus could have come down and said, all right, y'all are saved, bye. No, he got into the thick of it. And while he was doing, he's forming community because we are made for community. God's very nature is a communal relationship. So we may want to get off from time and time, and we need to get off on ourselves, but at the end of the day, we have to come back to community. Francis did it with the brothers and the sisters. There's three orders. First for the guys, second for the ladies, third for every, anyone who doesn't, you know, like families and that kind of thing, the secular order. And some of you are secular, so you know this thing. And of course, we talked enough about creation. If we're not doing it, who is? Okay, the last one. Quick run through spiritual discernment has to do with the will of God. When we're talking about discerning something spiritually, we want to know what God's will is, right? Whether we like it or not. <laughs> Most of the time, I don't like it, you know? I may learn to like it, but God always has the best plan because that's why God is God. So when we're looking at how to make a decision, we want to say, God, what is your will here? I want to do your will because when I'm in your will, that, that's when things you know, are going the way that God wants them to go. I want to be in God's will. So first of all, more important, I want to desire that. God, I want your will. You're, I'm, you're smarter than me. You're going to have the best plan. I may not like it, but at the end of the day, I'll know if it's your will, then it's going to be for my good. God is all good and wants good for us. So we desire the will of God. We discern the will of God. This is part of the course we used to teach at my last parish. So we consider, when we're making the decision, we consider where we come from, what are our traditions, spiritual and otherwise. We, we, we consider our understanding of God, and that can always grow. We always need to learn more about who God is. But it's part of, we have to... Um, we have to face off with what, what is our understanding of God. This is who I know God to be. God is good. Remove anything that gets in the way, and these are the, this is what we call face. The main, four main things that get in the way of a good spiritual discernment is fear. Our fears, when we're moving into fear, we're moving away from God. When we move into love, we're moving towards God. 
Fear is the opposite of love, not hate. Does that make sense? The only power that evil one has is fear. That's the only power he has. Because God is the greatest power. But if we move into our fear, then we're, we're moving away from God. We're moving towards the, the other side. So fears, attachments, that's what we cling to. We can't discern well if we're holding on to stuff, right? God wants to go here. No, I, I can't let this go. So that attachments get in the way of our good spiritual discernment. Our control issues. God, I know you're in control, but I want to be in control. Let me, I, got, I got a good plan, God. Have you tried this? I've tried it all my life. You know, God's got the, God needs to get control. And then this idea of entitlement. Entitlement is any sentence that you start with, I deserve, or someone deserve. What do we deserve? You know, we are nothing without God, and anything we have is a gift of God. We are entitled to nothing. But God loves us, and God wants to give us good gifts, right? But we can't assume that we deserve it. That gets in the way of good spiritual discernment. Make sense? And then, consider your options in light of the greater community. We are made for community, so when we're making decisions about our, you know, our life, we have to all put it, always put it in the context of how does this serve your people, God? may be good for me, will it also be good for your people? All right, so that's the discernment, extra, that's the work of discernment, and then once, even if we're not so sure, we at the end of the day, we gotta do something, right? Make a decision, evaluate it, and then keep on praying. Does that make sense? So that's sort of a Christian thing. I mean, the only thing that makes it Franciscan is we consider, again, a Franciscan perspective as we make our discernment, right? I'm almost done, hang in there. Okay, this is the end. Are you a Franciscan? How will you be celebrated as a Franciscan saint? So I got up there, Bonaventure. We're in his room right now. <laughs> I don't know, I don't, was he here? I don't think he was. He was um, right after the time. In fact, the story about Bonaventure, he was a great intellectual and a very, he had an experience, very much like Francis had an experience. And so he wrote that soul's journey into God um, as a result of that. He went to Laverna, where Francis experienced the stigmata. Something happened to Bonaventure there, and it led him to write that joke. But great intellectual, leader of the order. But his story, you know, I don't know if it's a legend or truth, but the story, he was, he was choking on a fish bone. <laughs> Did you hear the story? And um, Francis was coming by or something. He was a little boy, and his mother either prayed to Francis or Francis put his hands over him, and he was cured. His name means good fortune, Buena Ventura. It's a good fortune, so that's part of the legend of Bonaventure. There you got Maximilian Kolbe. What's his gift? He was a Franciscan, a, 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 I think it was a conventional Franciscan. But again, I gave, in the imitation of Christ, just like Francis, gave his life away so that someone else could live in a, in a camp in, um, was it Auschwitz? I can't remember that mm -hmm. camp. Gave his life away. There's um, Angela Foligno. She was a third order, right? Is she third order? Angela Foligno? Um, like Margaret of Cortona, woman, came on some hard times in her life. I think, uh, I was asking Father Joe Schwab, he's the expert on all these characters of Francis, in the early Franciscan history. I think she's the one who had a, a, a son out of wedlock because um, she was married to a, no, uh, she was in a relationship with a nobleman and the family said, you ain't marrying that girl. And so then he died and she was left destitute. But anyway, she, conversion, again, the story of, your life's going in the wrong direction and you move in, in the right direction, so she's, she's, she's a saint now. And who's this guy? <laughs> That's Ed Dunn, one of our friars. So um, I happen to know Ed. I worked in the Peace and Justice office when I was a student up in Oakland. He's no longer with us, but he, his life was given to peace and justice causes. He lived most of his life in Central America. And when, like when I was, in, after a novitiate year, we went down there. He took us into El Salvador and just showed us what was going on. You know, part of that was, you know, our country was backing this, this, the, the, the you know, I'm not gonna get into that, but anyway. Um, so he's a, he's a great man. Look how joyful he is, right? He, he's known for singing, If I Were a Rich Man. <laughs> so, um, but what, were your, what will your story and your picture be, okay? So we're, we're done. To, any comments or questions as we wrap this up? I know we went a little long, so you may want to get out of here. And if you need to do that now, go ahead and do it. But I just thought we questions, comments. Nick, yes. Okay. Thank you for wearing brown today. I appreciate it. <laughs> the brown jacket. Oh, is it gray? Or gray or brown? I should wear brown. What do you got? Um, this, this is very educational as far as the Franciscan uh, philosophy goes. So, you know, I've not been. I've been here all the time, but I've not been exposed to what you just presented. 
So, my question is, how is this different, so different? I grew up in a parish priest, and um, it's a common question. How does it years of Jesuit education. I knew real good friends. Jesuits, Franciscans. It's easy. <laughs> Jesuits got the brains, Franciscans have the hearts. Does that help? We're stupid fools for God. They're, they, they teach God's people. You have the Order of St. Peter. They're all Catholic. And your principles that you laid out, I'm sure, if this is a... I'm, I'm sure a Jesuit would not... Absolutely. As far as the dogs go, okay, probably would not match the dogs with the right? So, I, I'm just curious, you know, you have all these orders, which I would bet that there's a common goal that you just described. They're all Christian, so they're going to follow the gospel, but there's just shades of emphasis, shades of emphasis. So. Jesuits have that, uh, uh, it's a very similar spirituality. Again, we're talking 16th century, so 300 years after Francis. And it was a response, Ignatius was a response to what was going on in the church too. He was the Protestant Reformation. He was trying to get alignment back to the Catholic Church. But he has a great discernment practice, so they have this way of discerning the will of God that's very distinctive to their spirituality, but it's solidly Catholic and solidly gospel and scripture. We're going to emphasize more, again, this idea of incarnation. So we see God in all creation. So our spirituality is going to be, it's, it's a matter of emphasis. It's not a matter of like black and white differences at all. All Catholic orders, any order in the church was usually found, founded for a specific reason. To take care of the sick, so there's hospital uh, minis- missions and mis- mysteries, or it's missionary work, evangelize, evangelizing people that have not experience. So Jesuits would be big on evangelization as well as Franciscans. They were doing the same thing. So it's just shades of emphasis that would be that what separates us a little bit from our spiritualities and what attract people to us. Like I loved, I wanted to be a Franciscan because I wasn't going to be stuck in teaching like it would probably be with the Jesuits. I wanted the freedom of just bringing what my gifts were for just about, we welcome anybody. So does that help? Yeah. Yeah, Ken. Uh, yeah, Father, I know you like photography and you like to take pictures of creation. How do you use that uh, as a way for a prayer and to go out and take these beautiful pictures? I've seen them in your uh, calendars. Listen, thank you for coming. If you need to leave, please feel free to do so. Thank you for being here, though. So, go ahead. So, what I, my, my approach is, and are any of you are familiar with Georgia O'Keeffe? Yes. One of her things was she wanted to make flowers big so that she says, look at this, you know, I can see the beauty here in the smallness of this little flower, right. but if I make it big, maybe you'll see it. So that's part of my, um, not only am I just uh, experienced God in nature, I want to share that with the world so that if you see something you like, mm-hmm. you might have a greater appreciation for God in creation. That's kind of what's driving what I do with my art and my photography. Yeah, I don't know if it's working, but it, I certainly enjoy the doing of it. I think God gave me a gift to do it, so I want to share that gift. Definitely. And then, I mean, do you use it for prayer, too? I mean, do you um, pray? When I'm in it, like, that, my experience, anyone who's gone with me on a trip when I'm out there, I mean, I get like, I, I just, for instance, I was just up at Siena College near Albany, because it, um, it's, I wanted to do fall photography there, so I lived in October, I lived with them. So one guy said, well, let me, let me come with you. I'm like, are you sure you want to do this? Because I'm like a freak. You know, I know I'm a freak. I get so excited. I'm like almost hyperventilating. It's like a beautiful mountain scene with fall trees. I mean, I'm beside my, I almost crashed the car. You know, it's, it's dangerous. <laughs> so I, when, I, when I'm in it and doing it, I'm just, I feel like the presence of God. It's, so it just blows my, yeah. Yeah, and so people prayer. don't want to be around that because I get a little crazy, I admit it. I get a little crazy. That's a great gift. Thank you. Any, anything else? So I have a closing prayer, though. I wanted to close with a prayer. I wanted to start with a prayer, but we've moved into it. So again, I thank you for your time with me. Let's, let's pray this prayer together that is from um, the letter to the entire order. Okay, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Together, almighty, eternal, just, and merciful God, give us miserable ones the grace to do for you alone 
what we know you want us to do and always to desire what pleases you. Inwardly cleansed, interiorly enlightened, and inflamed by the fire of the Holy Spirit, may we be able to follow in the footprints of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And by your grace alone, may we make our way to you, Most High, who live and rule in perfect trinity and simple unity, and our glorified God Almighty forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for your time, Dan.